So Anurag, uh, I think you made the point about PowerPoints. I've actually done away with PowerPoints altogether. I don't use them anymore. So hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, this is uh, a lot of content, some perspectives in terms of where um, I see this technology going, we see this technology going as an organization. And it's a great pleasure to um, address this group on this particular topic because I do believe that this is a technology that's not only here to stay, but it's something that all of us um, should learn about and should learn about how to apply it for business. So I am going to make a little bit of a distinction in terms of AI, gener what is generative AI, what is generative AI for business specifically, and why there is so much potential in India to really harness this technology and, and play a leadership role uh, for this technology around the world. So I'm going to ask you to you know, imagine with me a few scenarios and water data to generate agricultural forecasting models to help him plan his crop planting, production, land utilization, supply chain, market demand, making his vani the key to access all the tech he needs. Another scenario, imagine a Bharat where a small scale entrepreneur setting up her business to make incense sticks, agarbatti, out of recycled flowers in Rajasthan needs only her creativity and command prompts to her laptop to build a website or a, and a mobile app for end-to-end -end generation of design elements for her product packaging that would appeal to her potential customers without having to spend a huge amount of money by hiring people who can build this, these, these web, web tools and others for her, leveling the playing field for her where not having an access to tech shouldn't be the factor holding her back. Imagine a Bharat where companies can proactively identify shadow data, monitor for abnormal data access, have, have the system shut down a potential data breach, and alert cybersecurity professionals to detect and remediate potential cyber crimes and cyber threats in real time. Imagine a Bharat where a large financial services institution can significantly boost coding or developer productivity by automating code migration from COBOL to Java to accelerate their platform modernization with reduced risks and costs. Whilst these, some of these may seem to be you know, out in the future in dreams, um, it's not. All of this can be achieved by artificial intelligence today. And I know that Anurag talked a little bit about AI, but let me just lay out a few definitions really quick just to set the context for what I mean. Simply defined, artificial intelligence or AI is technology that enables computers and machines to simulate and more importantly, augment human intelligence and problem solving capabilities. When we take it to the next step of generative AI, it refers to the deep learning models that can take raw data, say all of Wikipedia or all the collected works of Rembrandt and learn to generate statistically probable outputs when it is prompted. At a high level, generative models encode a simplified representation of their training data and draw from it to create a new work that's similar but may not be identical to the original data. Today, generative AI can learn, synthesize, not just human language, but other types of data, including images, video, software code, and even molecular structures. And I think there's, there was a. I think we had a NASCOM event, uh, NTLF, uh, a few, a couple of months ago, and there was a lot of there were a lot of questions. You know, is generative AI hype? Uh, I think all of us who spoke at it made it very clear that it's well past its hype. It's here, it's here to stay and scale, and its potential impact is just too significant to ignore. Take our economy, for example, as Gen AI breaks out from labs and proofs of concept into real world consumer and more importantly, business enterprise applications, its impact on India will be profound. According to an ENY report that was recently published, generative AI could boost India's GDP by about 
over 400 billion dollars which by thir- by 2030 which would re- which represents almost a 7% increase the cumulative impact could reach well over 1.2 1.3 trillion dollars adding another you know almost a point to annual growth and businesses today are increasingly considering this technology. CEOs n- know they need to tread carefully, but they also feel the need to act fast. We recently did a AI adoption uh, index report that we did a survey globally. 64% of CEOs, they say that they face significant pressure from investors, creditors, and lenders to accelerate the adoption of generative AI. And in, in some respects, it actually gets to the point of being being a little comical. So I was talking to a, um, a client executive of mine a few few months ago, and the, you know he had just sort of come out of the whole B20 cycles and others that had happened. And he, he said, you know, Sandeep, the, the pressure from the board from our C-suite is so large. And then to top it all, we have people sort of making statements that actually make it even worse. And so he refer- he gave me an example. He was at a B20 event, I think in either, either it was in Orisha or uh, MP, I forget exactly, but it was in one of, one of those locations. And a very senior academician, you know, stood up on stage and he actually made a statement saying, oh, I've been using Metaverse for 20 years now. And this this gentleman said, you know, the moment he's moment that was said, I got all these, you know, messages saying, why aren't we using metaverse, right? So there is an element, and I mean, the whole uh, the, the fallacy of it is, you know, metaverse using metaverse for twenty years that itself, you know, is is comical in itself. But when you when you have these comments sort of flying around, right, you do have a lot of questions from the C suite. Are we missing out on something, right? And but but without even even putting all of that hype aside, right, and put, putting all of that notion aside, today one of the things that our um, adoption index report cited and 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 laid out is that today fifty nine percent of large Indian enterprises, which is thousand people or more, are actively using AI in their businesses, and about twenty seven percent are actually exploring it. Interestingly enough across all the countries that were surveyed, India actually topped the list with those percentages. And the top factors that were cited for adoption of uh, AI in India are access to AI tools, you know, clearly a lot of startups, a lot of tools which are out there, the need to reduce cost and drive automation, and increase AI that is embedded in off-the-shelf business applications. So when you look at the the just the pure data sets, right, India is actually experimenting a lot more with AI than probably anyone else in the world. And again, I understand that, you know, uh, surveys are what they are. They are at they're a point in time and they obviously are reflective of sample size and all the rest of it. But it gives you an indicator about the amount of activity that's going on in India. Second, our golden demographics and rapidly growing technical talent pool have provided us with a tremendous opportunity here in India. Interestingly, all the progress that we are seeing around us today, with all of that talent pool, it's actually being done by a remarkably small group of people. If we consider uh, you know, a, the data from a BCG and an IM Ahmedabad report, it says that India only has around 45 percent of the world's AI professionals currently. I'll leave, I'll leave it to you to calculate the multiplier effect if we can just double or triple that number. So the focus on skill sets uh, is going to become important. But more importantly, when you put all of these data sets together, I see no other nation better place than India to actually lead this revolution. So the question then becomes, how do we make this relevant for business? There's a lot of work going on with, you know, this use of chat GPT. Anurag shared the number of 180 million uh, paid subscribers on chat GPT. People are experimenting with it. But I think what's going to become more important is how do we use this for business? How do we scale it for business? And it really has, it does start with the understanding what the enterprise truly wants to achieve 
and ensuring these goals are tightly coupled with strategy and defining what specifically needs to change to make that vision a reality. Leaders need to assess where work can be streamlined or augmented and how generative AI can be used to deliver greater value every day. The focus on business relevant use cases becomes really, really important. This, you know, if you use this as a hammer looking for a nail, uh, it's not going to get you the results that you need. The CEOs also need to have an in-depth knowledge about the risks and exposures the organization will face on this journey. Some will be similar to what they've seen in the past, including things like privacy, accuracy, explainability, bias. I'll talk about that in a bit. But others will be entirely new. And proper oversight will be needed to correctly identify, quantify, and manage these inherent risks. This actually then brings me to the key considerations. Again, I'm, I'm assuming this is mostly a business audience. So as you start thinking about using generative AI for business, I'll try to give you a few key principles as to where I see this technology going. And this is based on two filters or vantage points. One, you know, the time that we've spent in developing our own uh, AI, uh, generative AI platform, Watson X, uh, which is built on these principles that I'm going to talk about. But more importantly, on learnings from 700 plus pilots and projects that we are doing uh, with clients globally over the last uh, you know, several months. First, AI will be multi-model. One model will not rule at all. In fact, and, and as Anurag talked about different, you know, the LLMs and others that are out there. In fact, 60% of enterprises today are leveraging a combination of models. You know, they, they, could be, they could be, you know, specific models like, you know, the ones which we have is Granite, their own proprietary models that companies are building out, open source models like Llama. But the rash and the rationale is very simple. Cost, security, privacy, flexibility, and innovation, and, and at times that's actually regulatory concerns. And you'll hear from uh, uh, other you know, founders, I was just talking to a few of them earlier, you know, the, the focus to make these models and make them a lot more cost effective, that now is a, is a quest for innovation that will continue. Second, AI must be hybrid by design. That is, companies should be able to run their AI workloads on public clouds, private clouds, within their firewalls, as well as on-prem. And this is, I think, very, very critical, particularly with data security and, and data privacy issues. And in many respects, you know, we've currently most of the AI platforms that are out there basically require data to go to AI and then, you know, come back with outcomes. I think we are moving more and more into a, a world, and, and this is sort of where we focused our platform, is AI should come to the data, and data should stay where it is. Third, for AI to work, it must be built responsibly as a backbone of any new technology, because it has to be trusted. And this comes from transparency, explainability, and a lack of bias, and I'll get into that in just a second. Fourth, data does matter. In our pilots, we saw that enterprises with high data wealth are gaining an edge, delivering up to 2x the ROI on AI projects. But this is where data governance and compliance become very, very important. Fifth, while it's enterprises are still early in their journey, the need to tie experimentation to business value, i.e. picking the right use cases that will get using the right LLM, the right deployment option will make or break your ROI. And so really focusing in it on why are you using AI? This is the this is notion around not having, you know, a hammer looking for a nail, but really determining what is the business value that you're trying to solve so that the ROI value can be delivered. That is really, really important. And this is where I think there's a lot of discussion around are large language models the way to go? Bigger is not always better. As a matter of fact, we've just published some work which, which demonstrates that if you have the right size fit, fit for purpose models that could be a lot smaller, they have a much higher latency 
and they actually get the work done at a much lower cost. So I think though these are decisions that are going to become more and more relevant as this technology matures, as you know, innovation continues to evolve and as businesses start to use this. Now, you know, there are several examples which are out there. I mean, clearly, you know, if you think about life sciences industries, drug discovery and production typically takes a huge amount of resources and time. Um, with AI powered aut automation, this can actually reduce the speed um, and improve production speed and quality very significantly. Uh, in education and training, AI can tailor education materials and e you know to each individual's training needs, where it, it can focus for teachers as to where students need help and attention. Automotive manufacturers can more effectively predict and adjust production to respond to changes in supply and demand, streamline workflows, and 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 the rest of it. So there there are several examples like this. But I think this is where it's really, really important to pick the right business cases to, to really, you know, really drive this uh, technology forward. And so, so the applicability clearly limited to our ingenuity. Now, let me indulge, uh, indulge me for a, for a bit. And, you know, could I ask for a show of hands of how many of you would happily use an AI system where all you are able to see is the output or result and put blind faith on the system that has taken all the data correctly in the right context and without bias. Quick show of hands. And that brings me to my next point. I had three people raise their hands. They were ready, they're, they're ready to you know, take the leap. All of what I've said will purely be a dream if we don't build trust in AI systems. And trust is built with responsible AI that is enabled with data and AI governance. So just to go back to the AI adoption index report that I talked about, it found that near unanimous agreement by those who surveyed in India that consumers are more likely to choose services from companies with transparent and ethical AI practices. While 94% believe that being able to explain how their AI reached a decision is business critical. So this brings home the point that while not all AI models are created equal, every model does need to be governed. Taken lightly, this can lead to data privacy issues, legal complications, and ethical dilemmas, cases that we've already seen plaguing many across the world. So what is truly important, I think, as this technology advances, and more importantly, as it gets scaled for business, is how do we take steps towards trustworthy AI? And a few areas that I would just encourage everyone or organizations that are looking at AI, right, to think about as you govern your data and AI models. First, it's the provenance of data. As it's the, it, data is the lifeblood of every AI model. I think we have a saying in, in, our, in our company, there is no AI without IA. So, you know, if you don't have an information architecture, you don't have AI. So we need to be able to determine whether the right data was used, where it originated, how it has evolved, and more importantly, identify the discrepancies. We are seeing a spate of lawsuits against companies using AI for copyright and intellectual property infringement. And this will be more and more important as this technology scales. Most AI companies, they offer indemnity for copyright protection but not IP infringement. And that's where the numbers become really large. For our own models, for example, we have always ident indemnified against both because of the governance that we put around our models. But it, this, is, this is going to become an issue, I think, as this technology matures and scales. Second, AI systems will need to be robust. They need to be built to withstand intentional and unintentional interference by protecting against vulnerabilities to effectively handle exceptional conditions such as ob abnormalities in input or malicious attacks. Really, really critical, right? And third, AI models must be transparent and explainable so we can reduce any harmful disinformation, hallucinations, or deceptive content. We've heard about uh, you know, deep fakes and all the rest of it. It's really, really important that we are able to explain the outcome of where the results came from.
And lastly, fairness and elimination of bias is really important, especially true in a geographically and culturally diverse country like ours, where the detrimental repercussions of biased decisions based on incomplete or inaccurate data and models can be very, very significant. That's why, you know, for us, we have pledged the use of responsible AI, and I'm encouraging all of you to do that as well. So, in conclusion, I want you to take three things away from what I have said. For India to become the gen AI capital of the world, each of us sitting in this room and beyond will play a critical part, not only in experimenting with, but scaling the adoption and applying AI tools to solve some of the key business and societal challenges. Again, not using it as a hammer looking for a nail, but for key business reasons that we can actually solve. Whether it's solving our climate crisis, broadening financial inclusion, improving cybersecurity, or fighting the next pandemic, right? Uh, and, and just as an example, Gartner Report recently said that 54% of AI product, projects, only 54% are making it from pilot to production. So it becomes incumbent on all of us, not just start to work with AI, but to actually scale it in an organization. Second, we will all need to commit to understanding this technology and skilling ourselves on how to work with it, how to make our organizations leverage it and upskill our own employees to work with it. We are working to close this skill gap you know, as best as we can. We have committed to train 2 million learners in AI by the end of 2026 and with a more focus on underrepresented communities. We also recently signed an MOU with the government of India to collaborate in establishing an AI innovation platform that will focus on AI skilling, ecosystem development, and integrating advanced foundational models and generative AI capabilities to support India's scientific, commercial, and human capital development in this space. Third point, AI will change Bharat, but the terms on which it happens, they are up to us. That's why responsible AI will be the key to building generative AI for Bharat, AI that is transparent, explainable, trusted, and without bias. So I will end from where I began, borrowing the words of the great uh, Albert Einstein, logic will get you from A to B, imagination will take you everywhere, and that is the charter for all of us. Thank you for listening, and hope the remainder of today's sessions engage and inspire you. Thank you so much. Thank you.